All right. Let's cut down on the glare a little bit. Not that. Still picking everything up? That's good. A little bit of glare from here. There we go. All right. <clears throat> so, this is uh, Chem 102, Chapter 12 on Kinetics. In chemistry, we start off with, uh, you've heard the expression, uh, walk before you can run. In chemistry, we run before we can walk. In other words, we do kinetics, which is reaction rates, before we do equilibrium, which is the walking part. So, first thing about reaction rates, the expression of reaction. Any type of rate is a change over a specific amount of time. So if you're driving down the road and you're, um, you're traveling 60 miles per hour, so in a span of one hour, you will go 60 miles. That concept is similar for reaction rates. So a rate then, or a reaction, is the change in concentration of some reactant divided by the change of time. How long did it take it to do that change? Now typically what we do is we, uh, we measure the rate of the reaction at the very beginning. And the reason for that is very simple. In other words, if you've got a reactant and it's becoming something else, then uh, at the beginning, there's only that reactant that's changing. If you wait till later, you've got some B as a product, and in most reactions, that B could return to more A. So by that time, the rate of A is being influenced by the amount of B. Now that's not to say that we can't actually do those measurements, and we measure A as it changes over time, and use that information to deduce several things about the reaction itself. So, uh, we study reactions at their initial conditions, and we study them throughout the reaction time, where we're actually producing products. So, both of those occur uh, during an experiment. Um, the other thing I want to call your attention if we're going from a concentration of, of A under initial conditions, and we're starting, say, at time zero, and then over a certain amount of time, we measure the concentration again, uh, and uh, so much time has elapsed, say, whatever that happens to be. So this time zero is our start, at that concentration, and this is the finish at this concentration. So then when we calculate the rate of that reaction, we're gonna say ending minus beginning, right? So ending minus beginning divided by ending minus beginning, right? So this is where we get the delta T here. This is where we get the delta A. The point I want to make here is what's the sign? What's the sign on this? Well, this T is greater than this T0. T1 is greater than T0, so this sign is going to be positive. Right? But in this one, the initial concentration of A is greater than the concentration of A at some time down the road. So the sign on this one is going to be negative. So that means the expression 
is a negative value. And just what that means is the rate is the disappearance of A. This is typically, this is a typical data set for a reaction experiment in which we don't just get the initial values, but we get all the values that we are able to over time. I'll call your attention, at time zero, we only have NO2. So here's the reaction, NO2 yields NO plus O2. So here's the reactant, these are the two products. There are none at the very beginning. That's the initial conditions. Okay. Then you start building up products and you disappearing reactants, okay, at these various times. So at any time during that experiment, you could say time in the denominator, like this one minus that one, would be the disappearance of this one minus that one gives you a negative value. This is what it would look like graphically, where you start off with your NO2, and you have none of the products, right? So you gradually reduce the concentration of NO2 and gradually increase the concentration of NO, of, uh, NO and O2. Now, since this is a curve, we cannot directly determine the change in concentration simply by saying, uh, what is it here minus what it is, is it there? Because the line between here and here is not straight, it's curved. Right? But we can determine the instantaneous rate. The instantaneous rate is the change that occurs at that instant. Here's, here's one point that was chosen on this graph, and what we have is a tangent line to that curve, right? It just grazes that curve at that point. The rise over run for that tangent line is the instantaneous rate. So what does a rate law look like? Remember, a law just says what happens. It doesn't say why. We have nothing to say yet about why the reaction occurs the way it does. All we're saying is, these are the facts. This describes the reaction. Right? So for this reaction, a general rate law for that reaction would be a rate constant times the concentration of nitrogen dioxide raised to a power, some power. In order to be a complete expression of the rate law, we would need a value for N, which is also known as the order of the reactant. So whatever is inside the parentheses, this refers to it in terms of its order and a rate constant. And that's just what it says it is. It is a constant, it doesn't change. But we cannot deduce any of these numbers from the reaction, the balanced equation itself. It has to be determined experimentally. So that's what our rate law looks like. And we uh, typically determine these values at, under initial conditions. So uh, uh, we, we perform several experiments under initial conditions where we change the value of this one. And we conduct the experiment in such a way that there are no products or no significant, no enough of products to give us a, an interfering reverse reaction. Okay. Now later we're gonna 
we're going to need to know what this means. These, the difference between these two. The differential rate law is this one, where the constant, the concentration of the reactant and its order are all in the expression. That's the differential rate law, or just the rate law. Whenever we say rate law, that's what we mean. If you want the integrated rate law, where we've transformed this expression to take advantage of time t, where we introduce time as a variable. That's the integrated rate law. Now we're gonna see several examples coming up and it should uh, make more sense once we start digging into the reality of the different types of reactions that are possible. <clears throat> but before we do that, the, this is the differential rate law. And then there's an integrated rate law that is derived from this one. And because it is mathematically derived from the differential rate law, if you know one, you can deduce the other. Right? So sometimes it's easier to deal with the integrated form and then deduce the differential form. Okay. So when we, when we investigate reactions at their, under initial conditions, typically what you'll have is a series of experiments, minimum of three, but could be four, five, six, however many you need. Uh, if the reaction itself requires more than one reactant, what you typically do is conduct the experiment first, then you hold one of those reactant concentrations constant for the next one, but let the first one change. And then for the third one, you hold the first one constant. Uh, you don't change the first one from its initial condition, but you change the second one. So uh, the method of initial rates uh, requires that you have more than one experiment conducted under initial conditions that are changed at your discretion. So what would it look like if we have a reaction with two reactants rather than one, you just incorporate the second reactant with its own order. So the order of B is M and the order of A is N. But the rate law, in this case, the differential rate law, still has a single constant. We can discuss the order of each of the reactants in terms of its power. So N could be zero, A would be zero order. M could be one, uh, and in that case, B would be first order for that reactant. But the overall reaction would just be the sum of those. So zero plus one is one. So the overall reaction order would be one for that example. So that's just a reality check. How do the exponents or the orders in a rate law compare to the coefficients in a balanced equation? They don't. They are not related. Later on, we'll talk about reaction mechanisms. And for mechanisms, uh, the steps in a reaction, because one re a reaction generally occurs in a series of steps that you, re you don't see. They happen too fast. Um, they don't produce uh, products that can be isolated. So to determine the mechanism of a reaction is a guessing game and you just try to make intelligent guesses because of the value of a mechanism. If you can deduce the mechanism or propose a mechanism that works for a reaction, sometimes it gives you valuable insight into what's happening at the microscopic level. But for a balanced equation, 
it cannot be related in any shape or form with the rate law. The rate law has to be determined experimentally. Okay, types of reactions. Uh, since the order of a reaction is experimentally determined, it could be any whole number, it could be any fraction. But for simplicity's sake, we're gonna look at three different orders of a reaction, and they're only gonna be whole numbers. Zero, one, and two. Zero order, first order, second order. That's a good place to start, uh, and so we're gonna do it. First, there's zero order. And I'll just write the rest of them up here. First order, and second order. All right, what do they look like? Remember the data we had, where we had concentration of the reactant as it disappeared, and time, at what time did it occur? Uh, if we plot each of these with time on the x-axis only, So that's our independent variable, and whatever happens on the y-axis is the dependent variable. If we plot the concentration of our reactant over time, and it gives us a straight line, it's zero order. If we try that with any of these others, they're gonna produce curves. Right? So if we plot the raw data, concentration over time, it gives a straight line, we know we have a zero order equation. So what does the zero order look like? Well, rate equals K, concentration of A, to the zero order, which is equal to K, because anything to the zero power is one. Okay? So what does this mean if we plot that against that? This is why. Negative slope, right? This way is negative slope. That negative K is the slope of that line. And it's times Y equals MX plus B. So what's B? Well, B is the initial concentration. Why? Because at time zero, that line crosses the y-axis. The y-intercept is what A zero was at time zero. There's one other thing we can deduce. What's the half-life? I'm not gonna show you the der derivation now, so you just have to memorize this one. What is half-life? Half-life in chemistry is how much time does it take for half of your reactant to disappear? You have half of the concentration left after that time interval, right? So over this time interval, if we know the initial concentration and it's a first order reaction, uh, zero order, excuse me, it's just the concentration of A zero divided by two times K. So you have to know the beginning concentration and you have to know the K to determine the half-life. But if you know the half-life and you know the initial concentration, you can find out what K is. And then you can plug it in here after you're sure that it's a zero order equation. And how do you know it's zero order? You plotted the data and got a straight line. First order, so first order, how do we get from there to here? K, A, to the first power. The integrated rate law looks like this. 
since it's a curve, we want to do something that will straighten it out. So if we take the natural log of each, uh, of the um, concentration of A, and plot it against time, then we get a straight line. So now, since we got a curve with the raw data, we do a transformation and plot the natural log of A against time, and we get a straight line with negative K as our slope. Okay? What is the natural log? Well, everybody knows what the common log is, right? It's base 10. So it's equal to something. All you do for this version is you substitute E as your base. Right. So every calculator has a button for log and a button for LN, which is the natural log. So say you want to go backwards. Right? For this one, you would say, if you want to find out what A is and you know what the log is, you say 10 to the X equals A. For this one, if you know what this is, and you know, you know the log of that number is this, then you say e to the x equals a. That's the only difference between those two, is the base. e versus 10. So every calculator has an e to the x function on it. Okay, what do we have left? Half-life. So this is the first order. Half-life of a first order equation is 0 0.693 divided by k. Notice that concentration is nowhere to be found. In other words, the half-life does not depend on concentration. All right. So, for this question, this looks difficult, but it's really not. If you take it step by step, and I'm going to show you, a first order reaction, so we're given that, we know it's this type of reaction, is 35% complete at the end of 55 minutes. Right? So, from zero to 55 minutes, 35% of A has disappeared. So what's left? 65%. 65% of A still remains, right? So here's what we want to do. We want to take the integrated rate law here and convert it so that we can say that's the ratio 65% or 0.65 because this is what's left after you start with this amount. So that ratio is 0.65 because 0.35 has disappeared. So that's what's left. So this is a uh, simple log math and I'm not going to go into details here, but if we have log of that equals that, then e to that equals this. Okay, 65% still exists. So that means this ratio is 0.65. And that occurs at 55 minutes. So that ratio is 0.65. So what is it equal to? Well, it's equal to e to the k times t, and t is 55 right there. So minus k, 55 is the power of e, equals 0.65. Now we've got an equation. e is a definite number, right? So the only unknown we have is k. If you have an equation in one unknown, you can solve it. So that's what we do. We do a little log transformation, right? And when we do that, we end up with the log of 0.65 divided by 55, take the negative, 
because there was a negative over here. And now we know what K is, and that's a minus one over there in the corner. So it's reciprocal minutes. So we know what K is. We can plug K in right here. That's K. We can also plug in K here if we need to. So was that the answer? Yeah, that's the answer, K. Second order. If we plotted that data and it came up with a curve, and we tried this one, this transformation, and it still comes up with a curve, then look at this one. And to plot this one, you need the reciprocal. So the best way to deal with your data, if you don't know what the order is for a reactant, set it up in a spreadsheet. Time, actual concentration, log transformation in the, second, in the next column, reciprocal in the last column. Then plot. Here's your X, there's Y for one, Y for the second, Y for the third. Plot it, use Excel, and look at the graph. If it's a straight line here, you got a zero order. It's a straight line for this one. If it's a straight line for this one, it looks like that. Because we've got um, the rate to be consistent here. Okay, second order. That's the differential rate law. The integrated rate law then is one over A equals K T plus one over initial. Okay, oops, I went too far. So there we have Y equals MX plus B. So the intercept down here is going to be that value because that's when T equals zero. The slope is going to be K and Y is going to be whatever it is at time T on that line. One more thing to go, half-life. So what's the half-life of this second order equation? We have reciprocal, it's like reciprocal everywhere. Reciprocal here, K times A, zero. So whatever you start with times K, take the reciprocal, that's your half-life. <laughs> okay, there is a table in your textbook and on one of these slides that incorporates all of this information in one place. So I can erase it and you won't be losing anything. But I, what, I want to keep, uh, let me keep the half-life expressions. Because they're going to be uh, useful for the next set of data in this question. All right. So zero order, first order, second order. Half life. For this problem, we are given that the initial concentration of A is 5 molar. So the concentration of A at time zero is 5 molar. The first half life takes 25 minutes. So that means after 25 minutes, the concentration is cut in half. Okay? The second half life is 50 minutes. So after 50 minutes, with this as our new starting point, the half, the uh, concentration is half of that one. So it goes down from two and a half to one and a quarter. But the time is 75 minutes cause 25 plus 50 is 75. So that's what our data set would look like. So, process of elimination. If we're gonna write the rate law, 
we need to do some things from this information before we can calculate K because we need to know whether it's zero, first, or second order. And then once we figure that out and calculate K, we're gonna use uh, the information we got from that one and the rate law to determine what's the concentration after 525 minutes. Okay, so first, the law cannot be first order. Look, zero order is dependent upon A. Second order is dependent upon A. First order is not dependent on A. So look, the concentration when you start with five is this long, but when you start with two and a half, it's this long. So that tells us that the half-life is definitely dependent upon A. So that means it can't be first order. It's either zero or second order. What if the rate law were zero order, right? Then that says that the concentration divided by 2K uh, would look like this. Right? So if we plug in this value and the half-life that goes with it, we can calculate what K is. Well, if we do it for the first interval, starting with five, we get 0.1 as K. If we do it for the second interval, starting at two and a half with 50 as our half-life, then we get K equals 0.025. You can't have two different Ks. K is a constant. So that means this one can't be it. That means second order belongs to this set of data. Now we can prove it. If we just do the calculation. We're going to have to do K anyway. So if we set up K, uh, the initial concentration is 5 at 25. Right, so 25 goes with five, and we get one divided by 125. If we do the second set, 50 as our half-life, starting at two and a half, we also get one divided by 125. So that verifies that our order is second. And then we just finish the calculation, and we get k is equal to 8.0 times 10 to the minus three. So with this equation, that means we have one divided by a, equals K, 8.0 times 10 to the minus three uh, T plus one over A zero. Reciprocals, second order. So in that case, the rate would be this value times A squared. That would be the rate, the rate law. But we don't need that now. What we need is the integrated version because it incorporates T as one of the variables. And that's what we want to use 525 minutes if we start at 5.0. So 5.0 goes here, there, 525 minutes, here. Then we solve for this one. And that tells us that A is 0 0.23 molar after 525 minutes. So that's a lot of work, but we break it down into logical steps. First we say, what's the data that we've got? Then we say, what does the half-life look like for each order? Zero, first, second order. And we go through a process of elimination. We eliminate this one first because it was obvious. It, it does not depend on A, whereas these do depend on A, right? So then we actually do a calculation for this one and find out that K is different for each one. So it can't be that one. So process of elimination. We know now that we have second order. Then we can focus in on uh, this to get K. Then this one, which has the time as a variable to give us the concentration of A. Okay, oops.
Let's explore the differences between the graphical behavior of different reaction orders. In a zero-order reaction, the concentration decreases in a straight-line fashion as time progresses. The rate constant, K, can be determined from the slope of the line. In a first-order reaction, the concentration does not decrease in a straight-line fashion as time progresses. The graph of concentration versus time is a curve. If the concentration data is graphed as the natural law of the concentration versus time, the result is a straight line. The rate constant, K, can be determined from the slope of the line. In a second order reaction, the concentration does not decrease in a straight line fashion as time progresses. The graph of concentration versus time is a curve. For a second order reaction, the graph of the natural log of concentration versus time will also be a curve. If the concentration data is graphed as the reciprocal of the concentration versus time, the result is a straight line. The rate constant, K, can be determined from the slope of the line. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, just to review, how can you tell the difference between or among uh, zero, first, and second order rate laws with their graphs? Well, you, in order to do that, you have to plot both the raw data, the log transform, and the reciprocal transform, and see which one gives you a straight line. So, <clears throat> suppose we have a reaction now, instead of one reactant, we have two reactants. How do you study that one? Well, this is going to be the problem for us next week when we do our kinetics lab. And by the way, I didn't hand out the kinetics lab today. You need to go into Blackboard and print out a copy from Blackboard on the kinetics lab. I'll send everybody a reminder by email just so that you don't get um, blindsided by not having the lab ready. But what do we do when we have two? Well, remember when, when we study initial rates, we do it at such a time that we eliminate the possibility of reverse reactions, right? We don't want those competing reactions from products coming back and becoming reactants. So we set up the experiment in such a way that one of the reactants doesn't change. And the way you do that is you make the concentration so high compared to the A reactant that the B reactant does not change, not significantly. So that will be uh, comparing this one to our kinetics lab next week. A would be the color, the food dye, and B would be the bleach. So the initial, the first experiment we run we have the bleach concentration so high that it doesn't change. And we let A change over time. And then we do the experiment again where we physically change the concentration of the bleach, run the experiment again. So in the process, what we've done is we've buried the concentration of B in the, con in the uh, constant term. In other words, we take this one, it's so high that it's virtually constant, and we combine it with this constant to make a new constant we call the pseudo rate constant. Okay? That's how we get around trying to follow a reaction where two reactants are changing at the same time. Now, when you print out that, that kinetics experiment, um, there is a more detailed description of how this is done. And here's what the table looks like. I don't know if, if this is a, an earlier 
edition of the textbook. So this numbering system may change, but that table will be there. Zero order, first order, second order, and all of the details that uh, I was giving to you on the board. Okay, suppose we have a reactant where we're starting off with A at five molar, and K, we're given K, one times 10 to the minus two. Calculate A after 30 seconds have passed, assuming the reaction is. Okay, in this case, we're going to uh, just assume that the reaction is zero order first and do a calculation. Right, so in that case, uh, Zero order would be A equals minus K plus a KT plus A zero. So we're given K, we just plug in K, and we plug in T uh, time having passed from a starting concentration of five, and we find out that A would be 4.7. So zero order says over this amount of time, we would have 4.7 molar left, pretty close to what we started with. First order. Do the same thing, substitute K, substitute A zero, and time, and we find that first order, we have less. So the reaction is proceeding faster for first order because we have less at the end of the same time interval. How about second order? Well, we do the same thing, substitute in our values, and we end up with A at two molar. So zero order is slower than first order is slower than second order under these theoretical or hypothetical conditions. Now for reaction mechanisms. So what is a reaction mechanism? A reaction mechanism is a proposed series of steps that occur from reactants to products. A reaction rarely occurs in a single step that you observe macroscopically. It usually occurs in a series of uh, simpler steps and likely produces intermediates that are consumed in the reaction. Those intermediates you never see. You only see what goes in, what comes out. So these elementary steps, we call them. If we have a reaction here, uh, A plus B equals C plus D, then you might have an elementary step here of, uh, let's say, A transforms itself into um, E. And then E combines with B to yield uh, C plus some F, something else. So E is consumed. And maybe in this step, we get F uh, transforming itself into D. So F occurs here on the left, here on the right. We never see it. E occurs here as a product, here as a reactant. We never see it. So A plus B yields C plus D. These are elementary steps in that reaction. These are proposed steps for the mechanism. When a mechanism is proposed, uh, well, the procedure is usually the chemist has some idea about how uh, mechanisms, how elementary steps uh, are incorporated into a reaction and may propose uh, several, maybe a dozen or more mechanisms of elementary steps. So we have this one, this one, this one, this one, this one proposed. Then you go in and you look at the data and say, that one can't be. It, the data do not support that mechanism or this one, and you keep going until you eliminate all of them, but one is the most likely. It's never definite, it's just the most likely. It's like uh, Sherlock Holmes books that were written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, he had his character, Sherlock Holmes say, 
if you if you're looking at a uh, a crime and you've got several scenarios you eliminate all those that are impossible and the one that's left no matter how improbable is the right one that's what we're doing here with these mechanisms you just eliminate all the ones that are impossible and the ones that's left is the best all right so here's an example no2 plus co yields no plus co2 that's the overall reaction the proposed mechanism and this has probably been confirmed you know, otherwise they wouldn't give it to us as an example you have no2 plus another no2 come together and they produce no3 plus no but then this no3 becomes a reactant in the next step and it reacts with carbon monoxide to produce no2 and carbon dioxide okay so what we've done is produced this one but it's consumed in the next step so you never see it um, this one reacts with another one no2 no2 but um, in the process it is uh, consumed here but it's regenerated here so whenever you have uh, combining equations like Hess's law right when we combined equations in Hess's law if something occurred on the left hand side and an equal amount occurred on the right hand side of a different equation they cancel so what we've done is we produce this one here but it's consumed here they cancel we use this one here but we regenerated it here so they cancel so that means now we have this one plus this one there there yields this one plus this one and that's one of the conditions of mechanisms when you add the mechanisms together the elementary steps in a mechanism they have to equal the balanced overall equation that's the first condition so if you have any that don't meet that condition throw them out they're invalid okay what about these elementary steps let's go back this one reacts with that one that's a bimolecular you have two molecules coming together in an elementary step to produce some products intermediates or whatever so they have to come together with sufficient energy and orientation to react okay so they're somewhat less probable than a unimolecular which only requires one molecule to react it decomposes So we have the unimolecular step where you only have one molecule in that elementary step bimolecular where you have two molecules coming together and these are fairly common either one of these although this is less common than that one because probability of, of two molecules coming together with just the right conditions this one is almost unheard of the term molecular step you have three reactants coming together in an elementary step to produce some products or intermediates very rare <clears throat> although they do occur they're just uh, this one's the most likely this one's next and this one is almost impossible from based on probability alone now what else can we say about these elementary steps well each elementary step occurs at its own reaction rate they don't all occur at the same rate so one of them by definition is going to be the slowest one and the slowest one is the rate limiting step in other words the reaction cannot go any faster than the slowest step so once you find out what that step is that's the one that determines the rate law 
How fast is the reaction going? It's based upon the slowest rate limiting step. Um, and lastly, the mechanism that you propose has to agree with the experimentally determined rate law. And that's based upon um, the rate law is one expression that you determined. The mechanism, the rate determining step, has to agree with that rate law. Well, something's supposed to happen. Let's see if I can make it happen. The decomposition of dinitrogen pentoxide is believed to follow a three-step mechanism. Step one is a fast equilibrium. Step two is the slow rate limiting step. Step three is another fast step. Okay, so of these three elementary steps, for this overall reaction, the rate limiting step is this one in the middle. Okay? Um, and this is just for the proposed mechanism. So, first of all, does it agree? All right? Do we have two N2O5s here? There's one. Oops. So it's incomplete. In other words, we've got to do something to these elementary steps to make them agree with this one. Can we do that? Well, yes. What if we say two times that? So that gives us two N2O5s there, we're good there. But that gives us two NO2s here. Uh, one of them cancels here and leaves us with two here, but there has to be, okay, two of these cancel those, those two, right? Two times that is two. These two cancel. These two cancel each other. These NOs cancel. Notice the NO is nowhere in that reaction, overall reaction. So those are intermediates. Oops. So does that balance? Well, it appears that two N205, we need four NO2s on this side. We got two NO2s here and two NO2s there. We're good there. And we need one oxygen. So where's the oxygen? Right here. Okay. So, first condition is met. We add these steps up with this one modification, which is valid because we're multiplying by a whole number, both sides. And we end up with this overall equation. So that's correct. The rest of them will have to leave. Take my word for it. We've covered the topic that we need to. So what if we have this reaction, A plus 2B yields C? If we propose this mechanism where A and B, 1A and 1B react, what type of reaction is that? Bimolecular. Produces D. That's an intermediate, why? Because it doesn't appear anywhere in the balanced equation. But we take that D and react with the other B, and that produces C. Now, which reaction is, is fast or slow? It depends on which one agrees with the experimentally determined rate law. So according to this scenario, the slow one here agrees with the experimentally determined rate law. So how would we write the rate law for this mechanism? Well, Let's see if this agrees. Uh, we've got the K, of course. A only occurs once, 
right here. But B occurs twice as a reactant, right? So B would be second order. Now I know the temptation is to say, well look at there, that two is the same as that two. That's purely coincidental. The only reason that there's a two here and a two here is because these elementary steps say that this one is first order in B, this one is first order in B, so combine them to second order in B. That doesn't always occur. It just happened to occur for this proposed mechanism. Okay. So how do we explain what's going on in a reaction quantitatively? Well, up to this point, we've been talking about laws, rate laws, right? We haven't said anything about what makes them happen. In order to talk about theory, we need a model. And that's what this is, the collision model. The collision model attempts to explain why reactions occur at the rates that they do. What governs uh, chemical kinetics? First of all, molecules have to collide to react. If you got a molecule on this side of the vessel and one on that side of the vessel, you're not gonna get a reaction because they're nowhere near each other. It's just logical. They have to collide in order to react. So when they collide, what's required? There's a minimum amount of energy that's required. That's called the activation energy. If they collide with less energy than that, say the temperature is too low, they're not moving fast enough. Remember kinetic energy uh, is the, uh, well temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So if the temperature is too low, they're not moving fast enough. So they don't have enough energy to react. If they're less than the activation energy in the collision, then there's no reaction. If you exceed the activation energy, then there's potential for reaction. But that's just one of the conditions. And activation energy and temperature are actually uh, part of the same animal. So what else is required besides activation energy? Orientation. If the reaction sites on molecules are on this side and that side and they come together, no reaction, no matter how fast they're going. They have to be oriented in such a way that those reaction sites are close enough to each other for the energy to be used in producing products. So. The collision model says they have to collide, they gotta have enough energy, and they have to be oriented properly. That's why bimolecular reactions are much more likely than termolecular. Because what's the probability of getting all three molecules coming in at the right energy and all of them oriented properly? If these two are oriented properly and the third one comes in at the wrong direction, you're not gonna have a reaction. So the probability goes way down for termoleculars. Okay, that's just the definition of activation energy. Let's analyze the changes that occur in energy and atomic arrangements as the reaction between nitric oxide and ozone occurs. Initially, the nitric oxide and ozone molecules are separated and are not reacting. The forward reaction proceeding from reactants to products is exothermic by 199.8 kilojoules per mole. Let's see how the energy changes and the molecular changes correspond. As the reactants approach, their energy increases. When the molecules are in a transition state or activated complex, their potential energy is at a maximum. As the transition state is passed and the molecules become more like products, the potential energy decreases. Finally, the molecules reach the energy state characteristic of the products. So this energy diagram shows us <coughs> that 
at this point, the energy of the system is at this level. And as they make contact, the energy increases to a maximum, which produces the activated complex or an intermediate state. And if there's just slightly more energy than is required, you get over the hump and then you're headed down toward products. Now the difference between the initial state and the final state is the heat of that reaction. Minus 197 and something kilojoules per mole. Right, the difference between here and here. But the difference between here and here, right, up there, that's the amount of the activation energy that's required. We'll show you another diagram in a minute. Here we go. This is a little easier to see. So the reactant here is uh, bromine. Uh, well, let me see. I don't know how to name that one. Bromine nitrogen oxide, how about that? Two of them come together. And when they do that, they form this activated complex. See, and these, these dotted connectors mean that those are not permanent bonds. They're intermediate state. So when that happens, what you get is um, the bromines form their bond and then these bonds break between the bromine and the NOs. So you get the NOs separated and you get the bromine together. So what happens? This is a bimolecular, two together, and they, you increase the energy as they approach to a point where you reach it in transition state. So the activation energy is between here and here. And then you are on your way to products. And the difference in the reactants and products is the enthalpy of the reaction. Uh, this is just restating the collision theory of chemical reaction. The reaction of gaseous nitric oxide and chlorine to form nitrous chloride occurs spontaneously. In this example, we observe the only collisions that involve the correct orientation of the reactants result in product formation. When the nitric oxide molecules are completely used up to form product, there are still several chlorine molecules remaining. This is an example of a limiting reagent reaction. So they just gave me the name. Nitroside bromide was that first uh, example because this was nitroside chloride. Okay, so how do we relate the activation energy to the uh, rate constant. This is the rate constant for a reaction that we've determined experimentally. And this is the temperature at which it occurs. And R is the gas constant. It has to be the gas constant with an energy factor in it. Right? So it's this one. Uh, and the temperature has to be in Kelvin. So with all these factors, if we know what the frequency factor is, and that one has to be experimentally determined. So this uh, formula, this Arrhenius equation, is useful under certain circumstances. But um, we have other versions of it that are more useful. For instance, if we plot if we transform, excuse me, back up, transform this into the log equation with time, excuse me, not time, but temperature, with uh, 
the inverse of temperature on the x-axis, right? This is y m x b, linear equation. If you plot the log of your k's at different temperatures, taking the reciprocal, then the slope of that line is going to be uh, the negative activation energy divided by the gas constant. And then the y-intercept is going to be the log of that uh, proportionality constant, the A. So this is what would happen. Log of all your Ks. In other words, you have to do the experiment at different temperatures. And if you do the experiment at different temperatures, you get a different rate constant because the K is rate dependent on temperature. So at different temperatures, plotted here as the reciprocals, against the log of K here, we find that the slope of that line is this value. And the slope of that line is equal to negative E sub A over R, the activation energy. So you can determine the activation energy of your reaction if you conduct the experiment at two or more temperatures and plot the data. So, uh, a common rule of thumb for chemists, biochemists, biologists alike, is that if you increase the temperature in the environment for a cell, for a reaction of any kind, by 10 degrees Celsius, or K, they're the same size, remember? K and Celsius, same size degrees. Increase the temperature by 10 K, then you would roughly double the rate of the reaction. So let's see if that's true. Well, first of all, uh, if this is true, then what would the activation energy be uh, if that were true for a reaction going from 25 degrees to 35 degrees? Okay, so, oops. So here we have uh, what's T at 25 and what's T at 35? There you go, 308, 298. Then if this is the K at that temperature, and remember the activation energy is gonna be the same, no matter what. Then the K for the, uh, under the second set of conditions is actually gonna be twice the K for this one because the K determines the rate. If the rate in is doubled from this temperature to that temperature, then the first K related to the second K is double the first. So K2 is equal to K2 times K1. That's what this means. So what's the ratio? Well, if we, if we ratio K2 to K1, then we've got 2K1 over K1 because this is equal to that. And then the Arrhenius expression for each one is this, where there's the, first, the second temperature, there's the first temperature, the A's cancel, and the, we reduce the exponent, E, to this one plus that one. This one being negative and that one being negative. So that one minus this one makes that a plus sign. Don't worry about it, it's true. Then what we do is we also combine the T's here so that we can pull out this value, right? So two equals this expression. Now, how do we get from there to E sub A? Well, we can't work very well with exponents of E. So we do a log transformation. So we take the log of both sides, the log of this side, equals the log of that side. So the natural log of e to that is just this expression right here. So there it is right there. And this r being in the denominator over here, we bring it in the denominator there. So I did two things at once, going from here to here. So now we just solve for e sub a, right? So log of two and r, r is a definite value, here it is. And we've got the temperatures calculated up here, here. So we plug those temperatures in. 
Now we've got this equation in one unknown we solve for 52.9 kilojoules is the activation energy for a reaction that obeys that rule of thumb. Uh, one of the last topics. Now that we know what activation energy is and what's required, what is a catalyst and what does it do? A catalyst is any substance that does, one, that does two things. One, it speeds up a reaction. And two, it is not consumed by the reaction. It may participate in the reaction, you know, become an intermediate in the reaction. But on the, on the output side, on the product side, you regenerate the catalyst. So it may go into the reaction, but it comes out on the other side unchanged. Okay, those two things. Speeds up the reaction and is not consumed by the reaction. So how does a catalyst work? Well, remember in those mechanisms, the elementary steps, you have your reactants coming together, producing intermediates, and then you have maybe have several steps. What the catalyst does is it enters into that reaction and provides an alternate pathway for the reaction. And that alternate pathway for a catalyst invariably decreases the activation energy of the reaction. So this is what a comparison of the energy diagram would be for an uncatalyzed pathway versus a catalyzed pathway. The uncatalyzed requires more energy, activation energy, whereas the catalyzed pathway requires less energy. Simple. Too simple. So this is another way of looking at it. Um, the amount of energy, remember, when you have a temperature assigned, uh, a temperature of the environment, and your reactants are in there, that temperature does not say that every reactant is traveling at the same speed. You have a range of speeds, a range of energies for your reactants, okay? So an uncatalyzed reaction says that only this part of all of the reaction energies that are available, only this part will produce a reaction. Whereas with a catalyst, you take that same distribution at the same temperature, and the catalyst says this much more is available to produce a reaction. So that speeds up the rate. If you have more reactants available and with sufficient energy through a different mechanism to produce products, then the reaction will increase in speed. What, what types of catalysts are there? Well, there are basically two types, <laughs> homogeneous and heterogeneous. The heterogeneous catalyst is one that exists in a different phase than the reactants. So an example of that, uh, you have uh, this mixture of gases coming out of your engine, and there are some products of that combustion that we don't want to enter the atmosphere because they're basically pollutants. So we introduce a canister in your exhaust system that is filled with catalyst. And that catalyst is impregnated on the surface of ceramic beads. So it's in the solid phase. But the reactants are in the gaseous phase. They're in two different phases. The catalyst is heterogeneous. It's not in the same phase as the reactants. Um, this is a proposed mechanism for heterogeneous catalysts. And this is an example of a, a catalytic converter in your exhaust system. Homogeneous catalysts do exist 
In other words, the catalyst exists in the same phase as the reactants. Um, the best example is the biological catalysts or enzymes. Enzymes occur in aqueous solution in your cells while the reactants are there interacting with them. The enzymes are not consumed, but they increase the rate of reaction and they also allow for reactions to proceed at lower temperatures that are physiologically compatible with our systems. Reactant molecules are mixed in the gas phase, yet some reactions will not proceed even when reactants collide. A catalyst can be introduced to provide a new pathway for reaction. Catalyst molecules collide with one reactant to form new molecules. In this example, two catalyst molecules react to form two new molecules known as the reaction intermediates. The reaction intermediates will be involved in the reaction but all of them will be consumed before the reaction ends. The reaction intermediate reacts with the other reactant in the mixture to give the reaction product. The catalyst molecule is regenerated in this step, so the catalyst may go on to form more reaction intermediates. In this way, catalyst molecules are not consumed in the reaction. The final reaction mixture will contain product molecules and catalyst molecules. Okay. Um, this may be, I'm not sure if this is the right example, but this is an example of a homogeneous catalyst. Uh, in, in the upper atmosphere, um, through the interaction of oxygen and ultraviolet radiation, we, the uh, atmosphere produces ozone, O3. O3 is extremely effective at absorbing ultraviolet radiation. So that protects us on the surface of the Earth from overexposure to UV radiation. <clears throat> but what happens when we put certain types of molecules into the atmosphere, they eventually reach those upper levels. Um, freon is one of them that has uh, certain types of freon have been banned because they're very effective catalysts to the degradation of ozone. Uh, nitrogen monoxide is another example. Nitrogen monoxide combines with O3 to produce nitrogen dioxide and oxygen and then um, let's see We get, this is the free radical oxygen. We haven't talked about free radicals yet, but it's just a single oxygen atom. <clears throat> Combining with NO2 to produce oxygen. I think we're missing something here, are we? No, I guess not. So, um, the overall reaction is this free radical plus ozone yields O2. So normally, this free radical oxygen doesn't react significantly with uh, O3 to degrade it and reduce the ability to absorb uh, the ultraviolet radiation. But when we introduce nitrogen monoxide into the atmosphere uh, as one of those pollutants that comes out of your tailpipe, then we catalyze the reaction of these free radicals with uh, O3, and that produces, uh, by two-step mechanism, the degradation of ozone to oxygen. Similarly, uh, certain types of freon will uh, be degraded in the upper atmosphere by the interaction of ultraviolet light and produce these chlorine atoms. These are what's called free radicals, and at some point uh, in general chemistry, we'll 
talk about free radicals. And then the free radicals interact with ozone and degrade it further into oxygen, reducing the ability of the upper atmosphere to absorb ultraviolet radiation. So that's chapter 12 on kinetics. Um, what you need to do is take the review document and work some problems, do your homework, work those problems, and then um, next Monday, we'll do a review of this information, and following the review that day, we'll do the kinetics lab. And that's it. We're done.